Hey everyone, I just discovered this incredibly visually stunning folk horror movie called Midsommar and I'm very excited to share with you this breath of fresh air in costume design. It's also made me a little afraid to return to Ikea anytime soon. An American and Swedish co-pro, it's written and directed by Ari Aster, the same director as Hereditary. It's also from the same production company as The Witch. So it stars Florence Pugh as Danny, and while I often don't comment on the actors, she's absolutely riveting in this. It follows a group of friends who travel to Sweden for a festival that occurs once every 90 years, only to find themselves in the clutches of a pagan cult. But before I get more into the analysis, I have to warn you that there are spoilers, and I suggest that you watch the movie before you proceed. And I apologize in advance for my butchering of any Swedish words. The costumes were designed by Hungarian costume designer and stylist Andrea Flesch. While Flesch lives in Budapest, where the production was shot, she was hired out of London through her English agent. I'm unfamiliar with her work, but you might have seen her designs in 2018's Colette, starring Kira Knightley. While the grisly telling of the Midsommar film is entirely fictional, you might see it as a calling back to The Wicker Man and maybe even Logan's Run, but it's based upon June's Midsummer, the longest night of the year, and the Swedish celebration of the summer season. Just to put it into context, its origins lie in Sweden's agricultural roots. It was a time to welcome the months of fertility ahead. It's traditional to make flower garlands, which are brought by procession to place on the Maypole or Midsummer Pole. According to Real Scandinavia, this pole is erected in an open space and is the center of the day's festivities. As it turns out, the Maypole is a comparatively new part of the Swedish Midsummer tradition. It came to Sweden in the late Middle Ages from Germany, where the pole was decorated with leaves and raised on May 1st, hence the name. And since spring comes later to Sweden, it was hard to find the greenery to decorate the pole on May 1st, so the tradition was moved to midsummer. Gathering flowers to weave into wreaths and crowns was a way to harness nature's magic to ensure good health throughout the year. It is believed that if a girl picks seven different flowers in silence of the midsummer night and puts them underneath her pillow, she will dream of her future husband. Taking elements from Scandinavian folk history, there was a dictate from director Ari Aster that all of the members of the pagan called the Horga, all dressed in white, something that isn't typically Scandinavian. According to Fashionista, costume designer Andrea Flesch studied traditional Swedish folk dress or folkdräkt, which differ based on town and region. Here's a selection of Swedish folk costumes from the American Swedish Institute in Minnesota. Women traditionally wore skirts, aprons, stockings, hats, and shoes, while men and boys wore trousers, shirts, long socks, and shoes. As you can see, aside from the blouses and sometimes aprons, the costumes are vividly colored. Men and women's traditional folk dress come in two primary colors of blue and yellow, the colors of the Swedish flag. Fashionista also reported that the clothing, usually worn in rural areas, phased out during the mid-1800s due to industrialization, but returned to style in contemporary times for nostalgia's sake. Aside from small batches of reproductions and authentic historical pieces in museums like we see here, large quantities of costumes weren't available to rent, so Flesh and her team had to design and build at least 500 costumes for the cast and extras. And like the festival costumes of the Harga, Swedes made their own hand-sewn garments at home. In a Los Angeles Time article, Andrea Flesch said that the villagers' costumes are a classic Swedish cut and design. Christian's Swedish friend Pelle mentions early on in the movie that the people in his Swedish village make all of their own clothes. So the wardrobe department did just that, made all of the costumes from scratch. Flesch told Fashionista that it was very important that it didn't become a high fashion kind of thing, so you can believe that these people are working on their clothes for 90 years for this big event. Not everything is perfect. 
Flush said in an interview with Deadline that, it should look like they do their own costumes themselves and everybody has his own costume. That's why it was also very important that all the costumes look different. Some of them are better made, some of them less, to see the difference that it's not come out of a fashion house or a factory. So that was very important that it looks like homemade things in a way. Flush said that she sourced out something like 700 yards of 100-year-old linen fabric in Hungary and Romania and made all of the folk costumes out of that. She also ordered buttons from Sweden. I'm not sure if this was intentional, but the province of Helsingland, where the story takes place, has the flax plant as its flower, known locally as Lynn. The flowers have five petals and are pale blue or bright red. The flax plant is cultivated for its fiber, from which linen yarn and fabric are made, and subsequently, all of the costumes. Here are some examples of traditional Swedish embroidery from the American Swedish Institute and the Textile Museum of Canada. Flesh said that she used a lot of embroideries, original ones, a little bit from Scandinavia, but also from Hungary and Eastern Europe, because I found out that these motifs were a little bit the same. In all of the world, in folk costumes, you can really find big similarities between folk motifs because they were preparing the movie in Hungary and it was not a very high budget movie, I had to try and find a lot of things in Hungary. Flesh said that, the concept was that we start the movie all in white and as we go further through these seven feasts, everybody dressed up more and more colorful. Then every feast had a color. I don't know how much you can see this in the movie, but the idea was that at first we'd use only red. Then we put some blue, and then some yellow, and then some green, and in the end, all the colors come together. Many pieces were hand embroidered, while others were painted or printed, with costumes used to signify different families and even different jobs within the community, such as servers or musicians. According to Fashionista, there wasn't enough prep time to hand stitch the detailed patterns, so the designer found swatches of authentic Swedish embroidery. Flush discovered that other countries, including Ukraine, Hungary, Romania, and Peru, have similar looking folk style trims, which she then incorporated into the Swedish based designs. She tells Fashionista, We added a new color with each ceremony blue for the Atesti Pond ceremony, green with the little boy's pine dress for the lake ceremony, and only seen in the director's cut, and red for the animal sacrifice. She said that the colors culminate in the maypole dance ceremony. The girls dancing around the tree wear various colors, red, green, blue, yellow. The colors become even more intense in the final scenes as the Harga wear their most festive attire for the celebration of their May Queen. This villager vest, for instance, from the May Queen festival dinner is embroidered in blue, red, yellow, and soft green. While this villager vest, worn during the final ceremony, is bursting with an assortment of floral colors. The silhouette, by the way, is very similar to this damask velvet bodice from the American Swedish Institute. Fashionista wrote that the senior male members wear frocks, explained by an elder, as a tribute to the hermaphroditic aspect of nature. Flush said, this community raises a child altogether, so the societal norms are not important. Mother and father, woman and man, the elder men wear dresses and skirts because the gender is not so important. Reuben, the oracle of the community, also wears a shapeless tunic. The Horgan Elder costumes worn for the Atestupa ritual are in blues with a Viking silhouette of cloth cut in the positive and negative with rune symbol appliques. Of all of the costumes in the movie, the fabric is the most exquisite. According to the A24 auctioneers that sold a handful of the Midsommar costumes with proceeds going to charity, the blue linen was interwoven with real gold thread. As a point of interest, A24 pointed out that the tunic features holes in the back created to accommodate a safety harness. 
As a person grows up in the cult, he or she is assigned a specific rune which corresponds with their unique background, Flesh said. Each costume was given an individual runic symbol to identify the characters. Following along with the four seasons of spring, summer, fall and winter metaphor as explained by Pelé, Flesh said that every member of the community gets their first sacrament at age two, the second one at age 18, the third one at age 36, and the last one at age 54. According to production designer Henrik Svensson, the runes in the film are meant to read in the Uthark style of translation, which is popular among occult circles. Flesh said there are three main categories, balanced runes, unbalanced runes, or reversed runes, and prohibited runes. Fashionista wrote that, Using a runic alphabet, the team developed its own language, the effect, which also features prominently on the costumes. Village matriarch Siv is wearing the balance rune of Ansus, a rune sacred to Odin, god of wind and spirit, with the meaning, the gift of speech communication. Pele's rune is Fehu, a fulfillment rune of good fortune, material stability, security, and wealth. You'll find that many of the villagers have this symbol. Christian's runes, however, portend to his fateful outcome. His rune, Tiwaz, it literally translates as the god Tyr. Notably, it's the rune of sacrifice of the individual self for well-being of the whole society. And it's encircled by a series of unbalanced runes. When inverted, this rune is called Iwar, meaning you tree or you bow. The reverse position indicates that the situation may call for more of a defense than originally thought. Both the male and female elders have symbols applicated on their tunics. Like Christopher, Ilva's tunic appears to have the ruin Tiwaz, which can also mean a brave and noble death. I still haven't worked out the symbol on the elder man's tunic. Danny has two unbalanced runes embroidered on her blouse. Rivo, a rune sacred to Thor and Thunder. This rune reversed is indicative of delays and possibly difficult journeys. It can also mean that there are important lessons that need to be learned. And Thagaz, rune reversed, warns of treading carefully and conserving energy. Flesh told Deadline that, I did a lot of research about headdresses and really designed based on what was necessary for the movie and matched them with the costumes. We made some headdresses from fabric and embroidery and I think Daddy had three flower headdresses or maybe only two in the end. She said, I did a lot of research on flower crowns from all over, but I think in the end it was really from traditional old Swedish crowns. In the first, when she won the May Queen, she had a smaller flower headdress. Then in the end, when we go with a huge flower dress and she got the huge flower headdress, we had to remake the headdress because the first one was even bigger than that and she couldn't wear it. It was so heavy that she couldn't wait until we made a new one. Flesh said, it was a hat maker who made the base of it, and then it was the same woman who put the flowers on the dress. The first crown was so heavy that Florence couldn't wear it, so we had to make a new one. It was really heavy because the base was metal. Of Danny's little capelette, Flesh said, it's a true thing that they wear. This flower cape was not an invention of us. Danny's showstopper May Queen robe and spiked crown, outrageous but in a good way, was an original creation and from the vision of director Ari Aster. Flesh started working on the final look from the beginning. She said, the dress was the biggest thing in the movie. I think we worked on it for two months because we had never made something like this before and also Ari had a big vision for it. What was most important for Ari was that the flower dress looked like a meadow not like a fashion statement. We knew it had to be huge and wearable. First, we had to find out how we were going to make the base of it. We used 10,000 flowers, 
fake flowers. We wanted to make it from real ones, but because the costume took several weeks to make, we couldn't keep them alive. Of course, the first idea was, oh, it would be so nice to make the whole dress and the headdress from real flowers, but because it took weeks or months to make these, of course, you cannot work with real flowers. So I tried to find the best artificial flowers I could in Europe that looked the most real. She said, it had to be really wild, so we used a lot of small ones to get the feeling of a real wild meadow. The color was very important. We tried to use the Swedish colors first, the blue and yellow. The most important thing was to find silk flowers which looked almost real. We preferred to use forget-me-nots, sweet peas, meadow buttercups, corn flowers, and Persian jewels. But they sell it like a full flower, so we had to take off the heads. It was also a lot of work. The framing of the dress needed to be sturdy enough to support the weight of 10,000 silk flowers. Flesh said, we got the idea to make a hoop skirt for the base. My husband made it because he's an architect. It was more an engineering thing than a designer thing, the base. He made three or four versions. We kept changing it. Then we had to make the cloak to go on the base of the dress over the hoop skirt. We tried different things in at first, but it was very bulky and round. Ari preferred something not so round. We finally found the right shape and then, as you can see, we glued leaves on the whole thing so you never see the fabric itself. Then we started to glue on the flowers. The dress and the headdress weighed in at a whopping 15 kilos or 33 pounds. Flesh said that Florence really had to fight in this costume and it was very, very heavy. This was good because she really couldn't move either way in it, but that was the goal. The May Queen dress and matching crown were auctioned off in early May by the studio in support of a charity. The final bid was $65,000 and it was sold to the Academy Museum. That ends my frolic through Scandinavian folklore. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm working on some new content, but in the meantime, you can check out the costumes of Crimson Peak, one of my favorite gothic movies. I'll see you in the next video.